Hello and thank you for joining us for today's Talking Medium Voltage webinar. We're coming to you from the NHP Power Hub, which is located at the NHP head office here in Richmond in Victoria. So if you'd like to come down and visit the Power Hub if you're in Melbourne, please get in touch with the people here at NHP in Melbourne. Now, my name is Nicholas Burley and I'm your host today, but I'm being joined by a panel of medium voltage experts. So first with me today, joining me in the Power Hub is Dimitri Lazichuk. Dimitri comes to us with over 26 years experience in the MV world, specializing in switch gear, transformers, vacuum circuit breakers, uh, enclosure design, kiosks, and much, much more. So Dimitri, thank you for coming on down and participating in today's webinar. Look forward to your contributions. Thank you, Nick. My pleasure. Excellent. Now what we're going to do is cross over to Queensland. We're going to go up north to Queensland where we have Kim Kamat. Uh, Kim's going to be giving us his insights on the world of MV. He comes to us with over 12 years experience uh, specialising in HV protection systems. So big hello to you as well, Morning. Kim. Hello, Nicholas. And now we're going to cross, uh, we're going international, we're going over the Dutch and we're going to be talking with the granddaddy of Transformers, Mr. Sean Robinson. Hello, Sean. Hello there, Nick. Now, Sean, you've got well over 40 years experience with design, manufacture, testing, commissioning, troubleshooting, just about anything to do with, with Transformers. So I think you've got uh, quite a bit that you're going to be commenting on today with us. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming along. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, now this is uh, this is part one of a three-part medium voltage transformer series of webinars that we're going to be conducting. Where the aim here is to try and demystify transformers, and uh, and today we're going to be starting with webinar number one, which is dry versus oil transformers. We'll look at some of the technical differences, the applications, uh, some of the specification points um, that you want to look at if you're going to try and purchase or, or specify a transformer. And then we're going to wrap it up with a controversial panel discussion. And the question is, do oil transformers introduce a significant fire risk? So we'll see what people have to say about that. Uh, also coming up then in November, webinar number two, we'll be looking at power outputs and enclosure design for uh, for transformers. And then webinar three, we'll be focusing on designing for harsh environments. So, uh, so quite a few interesting discussions coming up over the next three months relating to medium voltage transformers. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get straight into it now. Um, we'll start by talking about Cast resin transformers as our first technology, and we'll look at some of the the basic key characteristics of uh, of these transformers and work our way way through them. So I'm going to hand over to to Kim, and he'll have a talk to us about those. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. So um, as Nick mentioned, we're just talking high level about some of the main features of um, dry type transformers. Or, or firstly, the the main the transformers we're referring here are cast resin dry types, because there are various types of dry type transformers. Um, but we're specifically talking about cast resin transformers. Now, um, generally in the industry, you will come across ratings of voltages between 3.3 kV to maybe about 52 kV and up to about 20 MVA in size, um, which is getting quite large, but that's the, the ratings they get up to these days. Um, now, if you look at cast resin transformers, and they have been around for a little while, even uh, contrary to some what some people might say or think, um, as we call it, you know, they're probably going through a bit of midlife crisis. Um, they, they're about um, in the age of about 30, 40 years, or probably approaching 50 in some, some cases, um, where they, um, they're, they're in, uh, getting into um, newer and more advanced technologies, which we'll talk about um, in, in the next few webinars. Um, the, the technology we're referring to here is the cast um, uh, vacuum type transformer, um, dry type transformers, which uh, essentially the resin is um, cast in vacuum. And um, I think there is some uh, content that we'll mention later down in one of the presentations around this um, topic. Uh, which um, which we'll elaborate on. Now, um, one of the beauties of having a cast resin dry type 
is also the resin used is self extinguishing and it is designed to be um, a fire retardant, uh, which is also something we'll mention and uh, unpack in one of the other uh, webinars down the track. Um, one of the comments that comes up, obviously, you know, as all we mentioned, is it is a it, they do have these days a long service life. Um, now, what does what does long mean? How does it relate to dry other dry types or oils? Um, we have Dimitri. He's going to elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, and over to you, Dimitri. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah. So, um, design life of castaways and transformers obviously depends uh, a lot on the application. Um, you yeah, have to to make sure that uh, transformer operates within um, the uh, resin temperature limits, um, and all this done through design as well as protection devices. Uh, but there's other important consideration for service life is the quality of the resin itself, and uh, the best way to check or detect the quality of the resin in practice is the partial uh, discharge testing which is a standard routine test for castaways and transformers. Now, with with the industry, um, typical transformers and um, which, which are compliant to requirements of the standards, the partial discharge levels go up to 10 picacoulomb. Um, with the best technologies available in the market, though, you can achieve a lower partial discharge uh, down to 5 picacoulomb or less. And, and this is where that indicates you know, high quality of the resin, less um, impurities, less air bubbles, so on. And, and that results uh, by estimates of our supply in a uh, longer service life by three to five years uh, compared to a, a normal technology. Uh, and this is where the technological process is extremely important. And that is a know-how of the manufacturers how to achieve that. Um, so therefore, we're talking really about the service life typically 25 to 30 years in the industry with our technology, we can uh, offer up to 35 years um, service life for castrays and transformers. Mm. So when, when you say long service life, we're really talking cast resin versus cast resin. At this point, we're not really comparing it to oil. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that, that that's correct. Uh, the technologies, uh, dry type versus oil, are so different. They're not comparable with regards to service life. And yeah, we can cover oil transformers service life later, but it is generally considered as longer um, because you're able to monitor and replace the oil um, in the oil transformer. But when we're comparing castration to castration, this is where that partial discharge becomes very important. Mm -hmm. the, the other point to mention about castration transformers is the low voltage winding. Now, uh, it's typically made out of uh, pre-impregnated um, material, uh, which is also uh, cured in the oven and becomes like one um, one one solid um, structure. It's not the same as the HV winding. It's not a f fully cast resin, even though for low voltage that's uh, well sufficient um, considering the, the voltage levels or the electric fields are, are much less in the LV windings. Uh, but it still provides a very good mechanical strength for the uh, short circuit events. Um, having said that, um, that there is a possibility to cast the LV winding fully in resin in the same technology as a uh, high voltage winding, and that uh, could be done for more extreme environments where you want uh, the, the best possible environmental protection of that winding. But that, of course, would increase the cost. Okay, now thanks, Dimitri. What's um, what's the typical maintenance requirements for uh, castors and transformers? Yeah, so typical maintenance requirements, they will really depend on installation environment. Um, of course, for every cast resin transformer, uh, from time to time, uh, the uh, tightness of all the bolts have to be checked and they need to be talked to make sure yeah, there's no, no loose connections, uh, especially in, in the core and so on. Uh, but, but, but the other fa factor that uh, will change a lot, um, it's a dust. So, as such, cast resin transformers are not ideal for dust environment, and this is where it can result in yeah, quite frequent maintenance and removing the dust. But in general, in a clean um, in installation environments, especially in the indoor, that's really a very minimum requirement for the dust cleaning. So, as such, um, and, and other than that, there is 
there's there's no maintenance activities. Um, the only other one is just a visual inspection of of the transformer, make sure there's not nothing suspicious, and the testing of the uh, protection over temperature protection relay. So as you can see, the re requirement is pretty minimal, especially if the environment is um, clean. Hey, Dimitri, uh, a lot of people sometimes think that the cast resin is a more expensive uh, option. We're here, we're saying it's it's reasonably cost competitive. Um, so from a, a cast resin to oil situation, uh, generally you find in the market that cast resin is pretty competitive. Yeah, actually they are, and, and maybe uh, the opposite was the case in the earlier days of this cast resin technology, but now they became you know worldwide accepted for the last well, at least uh, 20 years, and, and you know produced in mass quantities in different countries, and, and really the cost uh, what we see these days is um, less for the cast resin than for the oil transformer, mm. and it can be substantially less. Oh, wow. Uh, so really, when we're talking about applications for cast raising technology, we, we're talking about indoor environments, and that that could be various uh, types of buildings, uh, you know, data centers, hospitals, um, airports, infrastructure, and re re residential. Um, the obvious uh, big advantage of cast raising is um, fire retardant uh, material and non-flammable material that is used. So it's certainly reduces fire risk uh, a lot in the buildings uh, that is critical uh, for the outdoor environments. Cast resin transformers has been used a lot uh, these days as well. Um, if the environment is uh, reasonably, yeah, reasonably clean, so there's no dust, especially conductive dust, and uh, they even uh, suitable for installations um, close to the sea. Um, depending on the type of testing that that was performed on this um, transformer for environmental categories, which we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk about in our uh, next uh, webinar, uh, but um, where the cast resin are not, not really good, like I mentioned, uh, dust environment, conductive dust, uh, mining, uh, those areas, um, mm. you, you have to be careful. You know, there's no one rule whether it's good or not, just have to look at the environment. So Dimitri, I've just got an email come through from uh, from a person who's who's currently watching, and you've said there, uh, you know, about salt mist and, and and water. They wanted to know, is it possible, or is there a problem in actually putting this on the beach? Yeah, so, no, that's so. That's... Lit and I've seen this before. That sometimes you have the um, the transformers. They'll try and put them right on the right on the <laughs> sand. Uh, is is that something that you can do? And what do the ratings tell us? Yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, that, that's that's a very good question indeed. Uh, really, I wouldn't um, put the cast resin transformer straight on the beach. Uh, however, th there is uh, some very comprehensive testing that um, cast resin transformers can go through, and um, we we do have it in our range, which is E3 environmental category. Uh, it proves that transformer can operate under condensation conditions near the uh, seawater. Uh, so that's that's a big tick. Of course, you have to consider uh, protection against corrosion of all the parts, especially the core. And, and there are different measures that can be taken um, to to protect against corrosion. So yeah, uh, it's it's possible to install them closer to the water. Just have to provide a good level of uh, protection. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. So that's that's a pretty good overview of the cast resin transformer. What we're going to um to do now is because we're here in the power hub, uh, we're going to cross over to one of our medium voltage engineers, uh, Shadram Sadeg, and she's currently in front of our cast resin transformer that's on display, and she's going to take us through a little bit about the physical construction and some of the key points uh, on the construction side of the cast resin transformer. Over to you, Shabnam. Thanks, Nick. Here we are going to talk about the um, uh, physical construction of a cast resin transformer. What we have here is a HV, HV winding, which is cast in resin monoblock. That's the LV winding, and that's a magnetic core. What we have here is temperature monitoring probes in LV winding. 
these are the HP terminals and this is offload tap changer and if you come the other side of the transformer I'm going to show you the LB terminals these are the LB terminals and this is the welded lifting point for casters in transformer back to you Nick okay that was great uh, great Shebnam um, now let's have a look at hot and cold environments we've got two I think they're pretty interesting examples of places that you normally wouldn't think about uh, putting transformers but uh, in these two examples, we did actually supply casters and transformers. The first one is to the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, they purchased a few casters and transformers. And as you can see, it's pretty cold down there. Very cold indeed. So, Dimitri, you had a bit to do with this project. What were some of the considerations uh, and challenges that had to be addressed in order to, uh, to supply this infrastructure to these uh, down there? Yeah, there, there certainly were challenges, um, and and of course uh, the challenge there is the, the negative uh, temperatures um, that can go obviously below minus fourteen, minus fifty. Now the, the castaways and transformers were, were designed and tested to class C two, which is uh, minus twenty five. So it is uh, pretty cold, but maybe not still not not good enough to install uh, outside in Antarctica. Therefore, what we did, we just installed. Um, um, the, the resistive uh, heater inside the IP56 um, sealed enclosure, and, and that that maintains yeah, the reasonable uh, temperature for this transformer. So really, um, this was the specific of um, Antarctica application. And uh, I'll hand over to Kim to talk about another extreme example of cast and transformer installation in Australia. Thanks, Dimitri. Yeah, so another extreme from one extreme to another. Um, uh, talk about an application, Alice Springs, which is, as some of you know, we, or most of you should know, it's in the middle of nowhere, pretty much um, in the red earth, um, and it can get pretty hot there. So um, in, in that case, the customer specifically wanted a dry type tr transformer because of, um, as of some of the you know features we mentioned earlier, there was no, um, uh, no switch room or anything like that it was going into. So it was an outdoor uh, dry type installation. So a couple of the main considerations we had was obviously IP rating of the enclosures uh, and designed to still uh, cater for the full load, which in this case it was 6 MBA, which is quite a large um, you know, transformer in general. So the transformer had to be derated to or, or rated for a higher ambient temperature. Um, I think in this case it was 50 degrees. Um, and also there was a fan arrangement, which was an N plus one uh, failed safe arrangement uh, to cater for that, um, um, for the, the airflow requirements as well uh, for this transformer. So um, contrary to, you know, um, uh, some of the things uh, where transformers, dry type transformers or castors and transformers have to be um, in a clean or um, or an indoor environment. Here are a couple of cases where uh, they're, they are in very extreme and arduous conditions, um, but designed for those conditions, um, uh, as Dimitri mentioned earlier as well. Thanks, Dimitri. Okay, let's have a look at a transformer technology that I feel is probably not that well understood or spoken about here in Australia, and that's the amorphous cast resin type of transformer so we thought it'd be useful just to point out that it exists and, and where you can use it so let's have a little bit of a talk about this uh, fairly unique beast thanks nick yeah so uh, another thing with um, casters and transformers or transformers in general um, amorphous core is something that's been talked about for many many years essentially what it is is um, a transformer has two main types of losses you've got no load losses which are your core losses and your load losses which are your uh, coil or copper losses as they're referred to um, here by using an amorphous core which is a, a structure which is different to um, uh, and the, the atomic structure of a, a standard um, laminated uh, sheet steel uh, and that's what um, gives it uh, the less hysteresis losses which in turn reduces your node load losses by about 70 percent so uh, it's a significant reduction over the lifetime of the transformer so if, um, if it was 30 years i would like to uh, pass on to sean which had um, a couple of good examples that um, he wanted to share with us um, around this type of technology so uh, over to you sean yeah I, I, often the question that gets asked is you know where do you use the different types of transformers and what's the advantages and disadvantages 
Um, one of the projects that I've been involved in just recently is looking at the possibility of using amorphous core transformers in Antarctica. Now, part of the rationale here is that uh, obviously with diesel generation, the cost of getting the diesel to Antarctica and the CO2 levels and everything, anything that can be done to reduce the losses of the network are seriously looked at. And so in this case, amorphous core technology is being considered for that application. Uh, also, I know in other instances where uh, the cost of generation is very high, then the initial extra cost you pay for the amorphous core starts to pay for itself over the life of the transformer. Oh, Back to you, Nick. That's, uh, that's a, a summary there of the cast resin transformers. Let's have a talk about the oil immersed designs. Let's let's just go through some of the basics to start with, uh, Kim. Uh, thanks, Nick. Yeah, so really um, quite a mature technology uh, in Australia, probably commonly up to about, you know, in uh, transmission power stations or transmission stations, you would see them up to 220 kV and beyond and maybe as, as large as 300 MVA. Um, I've come across myself working in um, HVDC applications previously, um, up to about two, uh, 220 um, MVA size single phase transformers, so they can get very large. Uh, also very complex depending on the, the type of application, um, but they are a very mature uh, technology, meaning they've been around for a very, 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 very long time. There are uh, lots of different oil options as well that have been introduced over the years. Um, and a lot of this is around safety. Uh, one of the common ones these days, the standard mineral oil transformer. Uh, and then you could have um, a Canaan version, which is a high flashpoint oil transformer. Um, there are a couple of different um, options with uh, high flashpoint oils, which can be either um, a synthetic version or a, um, a soy ester based version as well, which is more environmentally friendly. Uh, Dimitri had some good points to talk about around um, a, a couple of other things around oil transformers. Thanks, Kim. There are two main um, technologies within the oil transformer family. One is a conservator type and the other is hermetically sealed. The hermetically sealed uh, name uh, tells us it's fully sealed. There's no contact between oil and the air. Uh, this technology is used um, predominantly in a, a smaller power distribution transformers, which go up to normally up to 3 MVA, but we've seen that uh, hermetically sealed technology uh, going up to 6 to 7 MVA. And really the, the demarcation line there is where, where you can have welded fins, and, 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 and this is where you can still have the hermetically sealed transformer. So the, the advantage of such transformer over conservator type that um, the oil deteriorates, deteriorates uh, much slower because it's not in contact with oxygen. Um, the the larger uh, power transformers, though, they have to be conservator type where you have an additional conservator, which is an additional tank where which allows oil to expand and contract uh, depending on the temperature of the transformer. And this is where the oil level you know goes up and down but oil is is in contact with air in that case. So you, you, it's not possible to do it otherwise for these larger transformers. So there, there are more specific requirements to there, you know, more frequent testing, more protections. But if we talk about so yeah, the distribution transformers or transformers up to six to seven MVA, or the hermetically sealed transformer, um, the, the, there's also a number of protection devices Oil is not con in contact with oxygen. Uh, there's still lots of cases, you know, lots of possibilities for the faults. And this is where we want to monitor not just temperature, which is pretty standard, but also we want to monitor pressure uh, and, and also the oil level and the gas detection. And there are devices in the market uh, such as um, you know, DGPT2 or similar types, which provide four protections in one device. So low oil, um, high temperature, high pressure, and the gas uh, detection. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, it's important to uh, detect the, any developing faults like internal arcing faults early on, so it doesn't lead to catastrophic failure of transformer, which as we're gonna see in a few slides, uh, may even result in a fire. But the purpose of this device is to prevent those faults early on and treat the HV circuit breaker. Now for the old transformer technology as such, it's a longer service life, goes up to 50 years uh, provided 
it's uh, correctly maintained. You know, the, the key to is transformer reliability and performance is conditional with oil. And that condition can be easily tested. There's well-known methods how to determine that and what what those um, um, different impurities or com uh, components in the oil indicate different type of, types of faults. So all, all this um, very well known in the industry by decided at which point the oil needs to be uh, refined or even replaced with a new oil and then extend its service life. Of course, there are other components like gaskets, uh, which you know, uh, deteriorate over time and could lead to leakages. Again, they can be replaced. And this way, yeah, the life of oil transformers can be maintained up to 50 years. This is what we've seen pretty commonly in the industry, or sometimes they will even go over 50 years. What about this next uh, point here, Dimitri? Bulletproof. I think your comment is a tank is a tank. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that, that that's exactly right. You know, we, we call a tank is a tank. So we'll, there's a couple of aspects to that. So what, one is that um, obviously the, all the HV components of the transformer is protected um, by the metal tank from environment. Um, the other thing you have um, the, the oil uh, inside the transformer, which allows uh, cooling of um, as you wind in as the, the core evenly and, and very efficiently. Uh, the, the other important factor with all transformers, uh, they're very resilient uh, to the over voltages because if, if there is a network over voltage, for example, it will resu result in mo momentarily uh, breakdown in the oil. Uh, however, the oil dielectric properties will restore very quickly because it will uh, naturally uh, mix, mix up and all those carbon will will go away from that point of fault. So that, therefore, essentially oil transformers are self-healing after their over-voltage events, which won't be the case, by the way, in the cast raisin transformer. So that, that, that's why we're saying it's it's pretty bulletproof. Maybe Sean can also expand on that. Yeah, probably 35 years ago, I saw this transformer come back to the factory and there was a, a bit of a story about this transformer. So stormy night, car comes around the corner and takes out a 300 kVA pad mount on the side of the road. Now, that event actually resulted in a fireball. Um, and the guys, once had got the fire out and got the transformer off the pad, they went back to the depot to get a replacement transformer. Unfortunately, the only transformer available was 100 kVA, so they decided that they would put it temporarily in place and go back and replace it with the proper transformer at a later date. Um, unfortunately, the next day, the guys were called into a meeting and told that they were going to be made redundant. So everybody forgot about this poor 100 kVA transformer sitting where a 300 used to be. And eventually, this transformer cooked itself and got to a stage where the paint was peeling off the outside of the uh, tank. Um, I remember an article in the local paper where a, a school kid had burnt his hand on it. It had got that hot. I remember opening up this transformer and looking inside, and there was just black sludge inside the transformer. In actual fact, it had got down below the top of the windings. And even to this day, I am absolutely amazed that their transformer had not arced. Um, it was like as the oil had just cooked itself and cooked itself, it coated everything. And yeah, that, that transformer did not catch fire. It did not explode. So there's an example, very extreme one, mind you, of a transformer that ended up being bulletproof, even though uh, the load on it was three times what it was designed to handle. Wow. It's un unbelievable, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Sean. That, that's a very impressive example. <laughs> All right, well, let's quickly have a look at the typical applications and then some of the uh, some of the obvious limitations when it comes to oil transformers. Uh, Dimitri. Yes, uh, so the typical applications uh, are outdoor. Yeah, the transformers can be used pretty much everywhere. They have uh, advantages in the outdoor applications but because, like we said, they're HV components are fully protected they're inside the um, steel tank, so therefore it's not sensitive to any corrosive um, environment. Of course, the, the paint has to be used of a proper standard to 
uh, to withstand those environments, but that's um, that is achievable. So therefore, um, dust applications as well, the oil transformer certainly has advantage over over cast resin. Uh, therefore, they're so popular in the mining industry. Now, oil transformers, of course, before the cast resin technology became more popular and mature, uh, they used a lot indoors as well. But uh, as, as we're going to talk in the next slide, um, because they present substantial fire risk these days, um, yeah, customers prefer um, minimize their use indoors, and especially that that um, requirement also comes from insurance companies um, who don't want to see oil transformers used um, indoors. Okay, all right. So just uh, just to make it nice and simple, we've got a summary slide here. So let's just very quickly run through this, and people can obviously have a look at this in their in their own time. So uh, Dimitri, let's just look at some of the highlights here and um, and discuss those. Yeah, so uh, the, the important point, uh, like we already mentioned, fire safety. Certainly, it's um, higher for cast resin transformers. Um, we're talking about maintenance cost. Um, if we compare cast resin and uh, chemically sealed oil, they're prob probably the same low to medium maintenance cost. And if you look at the power transformers, of course, their maintenance cost goes up because more frequent oil testing. Diagnostics on site, um, you can diagnose cast resin transformer, though it's it's quite expensive methods uh, where you can measure partial discharge on site. With oil transformers, there are more methods, you know, um, more readily available. And especially uh, if you check the oil quality, when we compare can compare oil to the human's blood, you know, from a simple blood test, uh, the doctor can tell lots of things about our body and same for the oil in the transformer. Environmental risk, um, certainly benefit with the cast resin that it doesn't present any environmental risk, while the oil transformer has always a risk of oil leaking, and therefore special measures have to be taken, such as oil bonding. Physically, uh, cast resin transformers are slightly larger per, M per MVA versus the oil transformer. With the um, over voltages, uh, like I already mentioned, there's more risks for cast resin transformers because you know, the over voltage event that exceeds the BIL level of the insulation will result in a catastrophic fault of this insulation. For using surge arrest is very important, while the oil transformer is actually self healing in the event of over voltage. Um, outdoor applications, um, we already mentioned oil transformers have an advantage, though cast resin can be well used uh, with outdoor enclosure in a suitable environment. And that uh, links also to environmental categories such as E2 and E3, which allow to use cast resin transformers in more humid environments or close to the seawater. Um, just an interesting, we'll just get into the efficiency discussion because this one I think is, is often again misunderstood, um, but is, is quite important. So we've got their efficiency and we've, we've got this uh, acronym in there, MEPS, and uh, I think as Sean will point out, there's another one called HEPS later on, but uh, it sounds like something you want to see the doctor about, but uh, rest assured it's not. Put some cream on it, it'll be fine. Uh, what do we know about efficiencies and what does this mean? MEPS and typically 99%, what, what, what are we talking about there? Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, one of the comments that I hear quite often is, oh, well, you know, cast resin transformers aren't quite as efficient as oil. And, and that's true. And the, the minimum efficiency performance standard caters for that. But you've also kind of got to put it in perspective. So if we're talking about 1,000 kVA, an oil transformer, its minimum efficiency, 99.37. Sorry, 27. For a dry type, 99.03. So, so the, they're still both over 99% efficient. And the difference between them is not that great. Uh, interesting that the standard also allows people to specify a higher efficiency uh, as opposed to the minimum. But the reality is, is that you don't often see it being specified. And part of the reason for that is that as you try to make transformers more and more efficient, it's the law of diminishing returns. So yes, you can go to domain refined steels and lower loss steels, and you can do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, you're trying to crib 0.1, 0.2 of a percent 
in order to go from minimum to a higher efficiency. And with that, the cost of the transformer goes up. So interesting debate. All right, well, that, that sums up the difference between the two. Before we go on, uh, again, I'm just going to cross over to Shabnam. She's going to take us through the physical construction of a oil transformer that we have here in the Power Hub. So over to you, Shabnam. Thanks, Nick. Here we are going to look at some of the physical construction of oil transformer. What we have here is an oil tank. These are HV terminals um, using plugging bushing with screen elbow connections. These are cooling fins. That's TGPT2, which is the protection device, integrated protection device, which is um, checking and monitoring all temperature, pressure, and oil level. That's offload tap changer. Um, that one is welded lifting point for the oil transformer. That's the safety valve. And that's the LV cable box. Thank you. Back to you, Nick. All right. So if, uh, if I was an end user or a consultant trying to specify a transformer, we just wanted to quickly run through some of the, the key characteristics that you really want to make sure that you're putting in your specification. Um, let's have a look at some of these key specification points um, that you, you should focus on. Some of the main things to consider, so as you can see on the slide, there's a lot of different um, uh, ratings or different um, uh, standards. There's mainly coming out of the AS60076 uh, standard um, and some out of the IEC, depending on what type of transformer you look at. So those are something, um, some of the st um, standard considerations um, that, um, that you should um, you know, refer to within your specifications. But the main other parameters to look at um, are obviously voltage, your power ratings, your impedance. Um, if you have a tapping range in mind, vector grouping, depending on where it's going um, and um, which which network it's connecting to, because sometimes depending on the uh, where you are around Australia or New Zealand, the vector grouping can be different um, uh, depending on the utility it's connected to. Um, uh, winding materials, that's um, another um, interesting debating, uh, debatable topic. And um, I think Sean has a uh, has a good example about that, which um, um, uh, he um, wanted to mention. So I'll pass you on to Sean. Um, yeah, th thank you, Kim. It, it, it's very interesting for me because I used to see a lot of specifications where copper was uh, specified. A lot of uh, consultant specifications basically saying that the winding materials had to be copper. I used to make the point that I could design you a trans a bad transformer using copper just as easily as I could design you a good transformer using aluminium. You know, the materials are different, but as long as your processes and your design parameters cater for those differences, so for instance, the current density for copper is higher compared to aluminium. Uh, so as long as you take those design parameters into consideration, it really doesn't matter which material you use. Having said that, uh, especially when we come to the cast resin transformers, uh, a lot of the manufacturers have a real preference for using aluminium conductor. And the simple reason for this is that the coefficient of expansion of aluminium compared to the cast resin materials that are used are very, very similar. And so therefore, the thermal stresses within the winding as the transformer cycles through uh, different loads and heats and contracts means that the thermal stresses are very, very even with the conductor versus the insulation material. Just something to bear in mind. Uh, you can have a, a good and a bad transformer in either material. Interesting. Thanks, Sean. That's a very, very good point. Um, moving on, IP ratings. You can, there can be lots of different IP ratings um, and environmental conditions, as we briefly mentioned before. But also at the same time, it will be covered off in um, one of the next um, upcoming webinars, and we'll unpack that a little bit further. Um, with regards to uh, 
classes um, there there is that there are uh, there are different classes around environmental classes which uh, Dimitri mentioned there in the, also Dimitri earlier mentioned around the climate conditions uh, which are ref more referring to um, uh, again casters and transformers uh, there's also a fire um, classification um, with regards to the same type of transformers as well um, and then um, one of the other parameters that comes into play is sound levels because um, especially for indoor applications, that could be um, a point to point of consideration. And uh, it is something that's mentioned in um, standards again. Um, a power output, obviously the continuous power output of the transformer is what you want to um, look at. Um, and uh, uh, Dimitri, um, did you want to elaborate? You want to elaborate on that point? Thank you. Yeah, so with, with the power output of transformers, uh, it's, it's probably um, evident to most of people that uh, whatever is on the nameplate of transformer um, as uh, shown as a rated power, this is what you should expect as a transformer output in all conditions. Uh, and actually, uh, the, the good thing, it is the case when we talk about um, transformers on their own. Uh, so regardless, if transformer is within enclosure or without enclosure, it still must deliver 100% output. Um, as per 60076 um, standard. Um, however, there is important difference we need to understand uh, in closed transformer versus a kiosk substation, where you can have a transformer along with other um, equipment such as HV switch key and LV switch key in one packaged kiosk. And this is where the different standard applies, such as uh, 62271 part 202, and uh, that, that dictates different requirements that allows actual derating of transformers within a kiosk. So right. transformer doesn't have to deliver the full output. So that, that's a key difference we have to understand. But as far as we go, just a transformer on its own, it's always 100% regardless of enclosure. Thanks, thanks, Dimitri. And uh, we will unpack some of those further down in a couple of the other present uh, webinars coming up. Um, so you know, stay tuned for that. Um, another point mentioned there is ambient temperatures and, and monitoring, obviously, with um, uh, as Dimitri also mentioned earlier, with oil transformers and with um, uh, cast trees and transformers, there are temperature monitoring techniques and uh, devices that are available. Uh, and um, the transformers have to be designed to the right conditions um, as well. So um, as you saw in a couple of the extreme examples we had um, for you earlier in, the, in this um, webinar. Um, something else to consider is um, around arc flash mitigation techniques um, when it comes to, especially when it comes to um, casters and dry type transformer for outdoor applications. Uh, there might be additional considerations um, you might have. Types of oil, um, as um, I mentioned earlier in one of the slides, um, there are different types of oil available for oil transformers. So it is again mentioned in the standard and also in the um, substation. Two or six, seven standard, depending on um, where the transformer is located. So that's something to also bear in mind. And uh, last but not the least, partial discharge is obviously um, um, one of the main routine tests that's conducted um, for a cast resin transformer. So it, it is an important parameter uh, when it comes to measuring the life of your cast resin transformer. Thank you, Nick. Over to you. Certainly is. Okay, well, we're almost at the end of today's webinar, and we're going to finish up with a con what we call the controversial panel discussion. And today's question is, do oil transformers present a serious fire risk? I'm going to play a quick video. This is um, uh, some recent footage in the last couple of years of two different events where we've had all transformer fires both but both based in new south wales so let's have a look at uh, at these and here you go so this is next to an apartment building uh and we've got an oil kiosk uh oil transformer in a kiosk here and as you can see quite intense flames lots of smoke um and then in this case here uh, it's a substation fire so obviously a much larger transformer and you can see that's uh, that's some serious serious flames going on there so um so yeah that, that doesn't look doesn't look very good but what do we see from the uh the cast resin side of it so here's a photo taken from a uh from a site where there was an internal fault within a cast resin transformer and as you can see there's a, a hole that's been punched through the uh, through the material uh looks like a lot of a lot of heat um, has been has been generated there. Uh, a lot of blackening, um, 
carbon and soot and other things there. So, Dimitri, maybe if we, we have a look at this, it doesn't look anywhere near as dramatic as, as what we saw in the video, but what, what can you tell us about this uh, this example? What happened with this cast mm. prison transformer and maybe why why didn't it go the same way as the, the oil transformer video we just saw? Yep. Uh, thank you, Nick. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good um, example of how cast prison transformer behaves in the event of the internal fault. And uh, the main uh, factor to keep in mind is calorific energy available. Um, in, in that uh, device. So, as uh, as we know, oil um, is highly flammable material and has um, plenty of calorific energy in it. Um, the, if the, the fire started an oil transformer, it actually cannot be even extinguished by a fire brigade. They have to wait till the whole oil burns out. Um, now, the, the difference with the cast resin transformer that uh, the significant damage will occur while there is um, electrical fault, um, electrical arcing fault still happening. But that is a very short event because the electrical arcing fault is going to be cleared by upstream protection in generally less than a second. Um, and, and then after that, the fire extinguishing fire retardant properties of the cast resin material kick in. And what, what happens that once the external source of that fault um, was removed, uh, such as clearing the electrical fault. From that point, um, the cast resin material will not will not support um, burning. Um, the it, it's so-called um, uh, endothermic um, a process where you know it 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 doesn't um, produce energy when it burns. Therefore, the burning very very quickly stops. And this uh, special test called um, a fire behavior test uh, for the class F1, which actually checks the, the behavior of this resin after the external uh, fire event uh, was um, was removed and, and, and stopped. Uh, so and it proves that the resin is self-extinguishing material. This this is why we can see there is a, a bit of a black you know carbon around, but that was the result of that initial electrical arcing fault and nothing really happened after that. You can even see the cables near the transformer. They're still intact um, down, down the bottom. Um, therefore, there was not any fire going on after the electrical fault. So that's a key difference between oil and cast resin, and, and therefore is well reflected in the AS2067 standard with regards to installation requirements, where the cast resin transformers uh, requirements for, you know, for fire, fire protection, fire clearances are significantly less than for the oil transformers. Um, and yeah, you can uh, read the stand for, for details. Mm. In, in, interesting, interesting point. So uh, the thing we did bring up previously is we said the oil transformer was, was bulletproof though. So in the event, like the, the likelihood, I think you've got a saying, you know, with the oil transformers, um, you know the chances of it uh, of it going wrong are very very low, but when they do go wrong, it could be you know quite yeah. significant in that in that case, can't it? Yeah, exactly. Low probability but high consequences. There we go. That's 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 a better way better way to put it. Um, Sean, you've you know obviously being the granddaddy of uh, all transformers, you, you probably uh, have a few things to say about this question. Do all transformers present a serious fire risk? What are your thoughts on it? I guess one way of looking at it, especially with the cast resin uh, materials being self self extinguishing, um, we can look at that as being an endothermic reaction. So, in other words, we we as long as there is power on the on the uh, transformer causing arcing or whatever the event might be, um, the reaction will happen. But as soon as that uh, source is removed, then it extinguishes itself, and the result is what you see on the screen there. Um, oil transformer, we can kind of think of it more as an exothermic reaction. Now, we, we talked about the fact that uh, transformers are, are bulletproof, and I gave the example of one where the transformer had literally, the oil had got down below the top of the coil, and it, it still hadn't gone bang. Now, part of the reason for that is that if you just simply think about a fire triangle, we 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 need 
a source of uh, material to burn. We need heat and we need air. And I think in the example I gave before, the only reason the transformer didn't go bang is because it was sealed and the tank didn't actually rupture. There wasn't actually an arcing event in that particular case. And so therefore the fire didn't start. But once, as you mentioned, Dimitri, once a fire starts, and air is feeding that uh, oil fire, the, it just continues on its own. You can trip your HV protection, you can do whatever you like, but that exothermic reaction just keeps happening until there is no material left to burn. Um, and an example, a very extreme one, I have to admit, but uh, a number of years ago, there was, I think for memory, 800 to about 1,000 kVA wind farm transformer and it had been noted over a period of time that one of the HV A-type bushing wells was leaking and it was noted that at some stage they needed to carry out some maintenance. Unfortunately what happened is the oil level actually dropped below the top of the tap switch, dropped below the top of the bushings and there was uh, quite a catastrophic arcing event um, split the tank open, and uh, yeah, the, the the photos were quite horrendous. Literally, a tank with all four sides split open, a, a burnt out core coil assembly sitting in the middle of a paddock. Mm. Um, you know, very very extreme. And as we said, you know, they don't often happen, but the consequences of when the oil does actually ignite and does start burning, the consequences are very high. Mm. So definitely guess, uh, worth thinking about definitely definitely yeah. all right well that's that's uh that's some very good very good uh input there sean thank you very much for that any other comments before we uh we put this one to bed kim no no i think you've guys um dimitri and sean have covered them um pretty much um uh, yeah on the spot it is Excellent. to say that really it's not that straightforward it's um uh, horses for yeah. horses every application is different uh, and you've got to think about where uh, where these transformers are going in and what are the risks overall so um, no different to uh, what we do in arc flash safety it's very very, very similar so it's, it's really depending on because the same thing applies um, uh, you know the, the the for the risk of it is happening is low but if it does happen the consequences are very high so that's why um, it's an important important discussion Thanks, yeah. All right. Well, let's let's wrap things up. That uh, hopefully that has given everyone a bit of an idea around, uh, you know, cast resin transformers, oil transformers. Um, we're going to open up the lines fairly soon to take some uh, uh, take some questions from people um, who are online and, and listening and attending this this webinar. So we'll uh, we'll try and read those out and and do our very best to answer those. Uh, answer those to the best of our ability and obviously with Sean being here he, he knows pretty much everything that's ever been written so uh, we feel pretty confident about that don't uh, don't forget of course coming up in November webinar number two in this three-part series as I mentioned earlier looking at power outputs and closure design looking at IP ratings and we will also have a super controversial panel discussion looking at dual ratings on transformers and can you simply slap a couple of fans onto a, a transformer and dramatically improve its performance? Who knows? We will see. We will see. Now, if you would like to know more, if you'd like to come and have a look at some of the medium voltage products, low voltage products, motor control, automation, safety, and much, much more, come and visit us in the Power Hub uh, located in the NHP head office here in Richmond, Victoria, but also in Sydney, uh, South Australia, Brisbane. We also have mini power hubs set up as well. So if you can't make the, the journey all the way down to Melbourne, get in touch with the local branch and uh, and they can certainly show you uh, show you some of the products and, and do some demonstrations. So thank you everyone for, for helping out today. It was great. Thanks Dimitri, Sean and uh, and Kim and Shabnam for your uh, your help on this and look forward to catching up with you in uh, in November in round two. Thank you. Yes.